Hi, this is uh, Walt Pavlo, and uh, a very special edition here. I'm here with my good friend, Margaret Heffernan. Margaret, how are you this morning? I'm well, thank you. The sun is shining. What more can you ask for? And, and where do we find you today, Margaret? Just so we, just so everybody knows, I'm in Ball. I'm near Boston, and you are. I'm in the middle of nowhere in the English countryside. Beautiful. A secret uh, location. <laughs> and an undisclosed location. Okay. Uh, Margaret Heffernan, in addition to being a good friend, confidant, and someone whom I have great respect for, uh, was a producer for BBC Radio and TV, has been CEO of several interactive multimedia companies, writes for Huffington Post, Reader's Digest, Fast Company, to name a few, and has written books, uh, The Naked Truth, How She Does It, and Women on Top. And in 2011, uh, she wrote what I believe is one of the more brilliant business books out there, Willful Blindness, Why We Ignore the Obvious uh, at Our Peril. Margaret, as we get started, it, it's hard to believe it's been about, uh, I think, a little over five years um, since we met uh, to be interviewed on your book in, in Washington, D.C. Um, so we, we go back a little bit. Um, I love the book. Um, it's obviously our, our text that you know that we're going to be using in, in the class because it it combines studies that you know what I believe are empirical or scientific data and matches them with with uh, you know current cases in people um, and it kind of gives us an, an idea of why good people you know make the mistakes that, that they do. Um, as we get started, let me just first by asking you know, you know willful blindness. What, bl blindness. What experience from your past made you want to write about you know, why people are willfully blind? Yeah. Well, I think there were a couple of things. Um, I first encountered the phrase willful blindness when I was writing two plays about Enron. And um, at the end of the trial in which Jeff Skilling and Ken Lay were tried, Judge Simeon Lake explained to the jury the legal concept of willful blindness which says that if there are things that you could know and you should know and you somehow manage not to know, then under the law you should be treated as though you had that knowledge. And I read that and kind of chills went down my spine because certainly as a former CEO I know for sure there were situations um, where I could and should have known something and, and really didn't. Well, I was also very taken by the idea because I've never really believed that when things go wrong on a massive scale, like Enron, or like the Catholic Church, or like uh, Germany in the uh, Third Reich, I've never really believed that you can ascribe that entirely to bad people. I mean, in particular, you know, the numbers are such that if it's all because they are individually bad people, then gee, there aren't very many good people around. <laughs> so it seemed to me that the question was much more, how is it that good people do bad things? And in particular, why is it that they could know and should know, but manage not to know? And, um, and in the book, there's very deliberately an example of of willful blindness in my own life because I was very keen to make it clear that I don't write about this because I think I'm oblivious uh, because I think I'm somehow uh, impervious to it I think it's part of human nature and um, I'm as susceptible as anybody else well and, and I, I appreciated you know the, the, the candor which you handled your own personal situation we'll let our, our, our class read into that mm -hmm. um, but it's one thing going from uh, love is blind <laughs> to willful blindness in a in a uh, corporate or white collar crime or unethical behavior sort of thing. But in the book, you you do draw the parallels to to both. Well, I I do believe that um, that companies are just full of human beings. And, um, and we have to understand human beings' individual behavior if we're going to understand how they behave at work. Now, there clearly is a difference between individual psychology and group psychology. Um, 
and that's primarily but not exclusively a difference of amplification. In other words, if you're willfully blind in your private life, it makes it more likely, I think, that you will be willfully blind en masse. Now, there's a kind of positive aspect to this, which is in a group of people, it's more likely that other people will see things you are blind to. So in theory, in a group, in a company, you can and should help each other. The difficulty is that in a group also there are additional forces at work which may impede that capacity to help and protect one another. So I don't, you know, it's really interesting to me that most business books treat um, the people within companies um, as if they're somehow radically different from people the rest of their lives. And I just really don't buy it. I think, um, you know, I think we do, we do bring ourselves to work. Sometimes we leave behind the best bits. Um, but we have to see companies as full of individuals who may be doing different things in different ways than they do at home, but nevertheless have many of the same characteristics. No, and, and one of the things that, that I got out of the the, uh, the book, Margaret, and it's something that uh, I don't if, if you've read some of the there's in the New York Times more recently, and I think Reuters even wrote something on it recently was this this question: Why do good people do bad things? And it's it's something we've struggled with a long time, but I think particularly in in uh, here in the states, as we look at some of the insider trading cases that have gone on, sometimes. It looks as though people are, are giving up, they're doing bad things for little or no money. I mean, that seemed to be the ultimate incentive at one time as to why good people did bad things. Right. Now, now, now it's called into question: Why are people, you know, do, doing these these bad things? Well, so I think um, I think it's really important and interesting that some of these crimes have not netted huge amounts of money because. Um, certainly after the banking crisis it became very fashionable to say oh it's all greed it's all greedy people and the thing about saying that is the implication is well I'm not greedy therefore I'd never do anything wrong and I think that's um, kind of smug. Uh, human beings need many things and money is one of them uh, but status is another and undoubtedly the ability to pull off cool deals, clever deals, intricate deals, unexpected deals, those deliver fantastic status to the people who do them. So that's a reward. At the same time we know that people are highly social beings and um, for perfectly good evolutionary reasons we want to be part of the club. We have a far greater survival chances if we're part of the club. So if the club is very competitive, very hard driving, perhaps not wildly ethical. In our desire to belong, we may adopt, if you like, the protective coloration of that group. And I think the thing that's particularly tricky about this is that as we do so, far from having alarm bells going off in our heads, we have this warm glow which is part of belonging. So not only do we not feel we're doing something bad, we may feel better than ever. Wow! Yeah. All right. Well, I, I mean, I, I'm sitting here recounting my own <laughs> my own warm, glowing feelings yeah. as you as you, as you say that. Well, I'm, I'm thinking of you in the Cayman Islands. You know, there there are sort of moments, and I think this shows great kind of reflection on your part. You know, that there are moments when it would be completely disingenuous to see to say, oh, I was wrapped with guilt. You know, often at these moments of greatest ethical peril, we feel our best, top of the world. Very, very, no, very, very true. I'll, I'll, I'll vouch for that. And as you, uh, you so uh, well put it, I, I actually made a, a part of your chat, a couple of chapters in the book too. So, <laughs> um, Margaret, in, in closing, one of the things that I, that I always try to I express to, to students or any audience, just as you do, we want to bring them challenges about what's going on in the world, but you know what? Let's leave them with some solutions too. You know, you know, there there has to be hope out there. 
what can people do to be more ethical, to make better decisions in today's you know business environment, particularly as it relates to these eager MBAs that are heading out into the world once they graduate here? Sure. Um, there are lots of things, and I'll go from kind of the you know the tiny to the gigantic, really. Um, I think one thing, particularly thinking of students, very important not to load yourself with debt. One of the things that really concerns me is we have now have a generation of you know carrying huge debt um, as salaries are not increasing, and that puts people under a lot of pressure. And under a lot of pressure, we often make very poor decisions. Um, really simple things: you get enough sleep, don't multitask, focus. Give yourself time to think about your work and reflect on what it means. Think about uh, if I went home to my parents or my partner and talked about what I'd done today, would I feel really comfortable and proud of that or would I have to edit it somewhat? Um, try and seek out people who are quite different from you, who therefore will offer different kinds of perspectives, value systems, different contexts. Uh, we're highly driven to congregate with people who will amplify and reinforce our biases. But if we can find people and learn how to get along with people who are very different, uh, they can be a fantastic reality check for us. And I think the other thing is recognize that willful blindness is, I think, a fundamental part of human nature. And therefore, we have to remember that there's always a lot we're not seeing. And we could do worse than ask, what am I missing? What are other people seeing? Um, what might I see if I weren't so busy, tired, distractive, or eager to fit in? Beautiful, beautiful. Margaret Heffernan, good friend, unbelievable book, great author. Best to you, Margaret. Thanks so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thanks to you, Walt, and good luck to your class.